Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining me in the locker room on this October 25th. I'm Alan Locker. Joining me today for an author's afternoon is Tom Lasanti, whose new book, Ryan's Hope, an Oral History of Daytime's Groundbreaking Soap, is out right now. The book is a definitive look at the popular serial from the people who made it so beloved and how it made its way into millions of households through a combination of compelling storylines, incredible publicity, a slew of younger viewers who became loyal fans, and daytime star power that made it so innovative, innovative during the golden age of daytime soap operas. Joining us later in the show to discuss the book and their experience working on this beloved soap are Christopher Durham, Dakota Smith, and Eileen Kristen Delia Ryan. Please help me welcome to the locker room, Tom Lasanti. Hey, Tom. Hi, Alan. How are you? I'm well. How are you? Congratulations. Good, thank you. Congrats, congrats, congrats. And, you know, as I've told you this off camera, I must say it for everyone watching today. I read the book cover to cover. Um, I don't know that I've ever read a TV book cover to cover. Um, <laughs> And I never watched Ryan's Hope, and I, I truly believe any daytime fan is going to love this book. Um, oh, thank you. You just, just the way it was written with the interviews and stories and uh, behind the scenes uh, information is just phenomenal. And, you know, you and I have a mutual friend in Rich Perlamo. Yes, for years I bowled with Rich, and he would tell me about his friend that worked at PG when he was going to this fabulous. PR parties, and I'd be very <laughs> jealous. I'd be like, oh, God, I wish I had that job. <laughs> yeah, I keep rich to some Emmy parties yes. as well. <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. I spoke at my alma mater, Fairleigh Dickinson University, last night uh, oh. about my parents' Holocaust experience. Completely different. Um, but the first young woman to come into the room was a student who watched the locker room, who is a huge fan of Ryan's Hope. Oh, Not gosh. even born when the show went off the air. Wow. The show went off the air 34 years ago. Yeah. She watched it all, whatever was available on YouTube and fell in love. Catherine, if you're watching, thank you for saying hello. I mean, I, I found that incredible, the power of this show to still attract after it's off the air like that. Even some of the actors and actresses I interviewed, uh, had no even had no idea even that Soapnet reran it in the early 2000s. Um, Andrew Robinson said he only found out when he was doing Star Trek autograph shows and people were showing up with photos of him as Frank Ryan. And he's like, where'd you dig this up? And they're like, oh, you know, you, we saw you on Soapnet. And he had no idea what Soapnet was and they would explain it to, to him. So yeah, I think a lot of the people didn't realize it had the lasting power of Ryan's hope. It's crazy, it's crazy. Um, who introduced you to Soaps and who introduced you to Ryan's Hope? I introduced myself to Ryan. So I was a college student going to NASA Community College out on Long Island. And I had, it was the spring of 1980. And I had uh, a break between classes. And one day I was home eating lunch and I'm flipping through the channels and I see this pretty blonde that reminded me of Kara Lindley who started in the Poseidon Adventure, the posters behind me. And I just stopped and watched and she's fretting to this guy that the big mom boss who secretly financed her restaurant was killed and that turned out the mob boss ordered the hit on the show's beloved heroine, Mary Ryan, a few months prior. And she was afraid the Ryan family was gonna find out that she's in part, her, secret partnership with this guy and the restaurant was in the crystal palace and tavern on the green and i was sitting there eating and eating and watching having no idea what i was watching and then the end credits came and it's like ryan's hope and i'm like ryan's hope that's a soap opera they don't have like mafia plots on soap operas and i kept coming back and then found out my grandmother loved the abc stories and ryan's hope because she was a very uh she was very catholic she loved the catholic Irish Catholic family. And she mm -hmm. used to fill me in before the VCR about what Delia was up to and hear it when I missed some of the episodes. So that I thought so basically I found it myself. So how did you get to go back to 75 at some point? 
Yes, when, well, in 2000 when SoapNet reran it, but I started watching it. I think it was April of 1980, and I watched it to the bitter end. Um, and and get, and that uh, for me, 1980, 81, 82, 83 uh, are my favorite years because it, for me, it's nostalgia. You know, and the 1975 to 80 are great, but for me, the nostalgia years were that whole because that mob plot line lasted until. Well, it went beyond 83. We had 1983. So, yeah, I was hooked. <laughs> and I just stayed with it. Was it the only show you were hooked on? Well, what happened was I, a few months later, my Aunt Marie got me a job filing mortgages at a bank near the college where I was going to. And she brought me, they brought me to the basement where the mortgage vault was. And it was opposite the kitchen where the ladies would have lunch and there's a TV. So at, I would sit there and file my mortgages facing the TV and 12 o'clock was Family Feud and Ryan Soap. Then the one o'clock crowd came down for all my children. Then the two o'clock crowd came down for One Life to Live. So for a, a short period, I was hooked on all three. And then I quickly, one of the new girls came and she was an NBC fan and she would watch, and she, if she got down there first, she would watch Another World and the One Life Delivers would come down and be so annoyed and they'd sit there like choking down their lunch because they had to watch Another World. <laughs> nice. I liked Another World actually. And then I would stay for Texas. I love Texas. I didn't watch General Hospital. So yeah, I was hooked for a number, like from 80 to like 84, I worked there. I was hooked on all those, all those soaps. I, I love it. So you've written 11 books about film and television in the 60s and 70s. How did you get started on the writing journey? I worked for the um, New York Public Library for the Performing Arts. Uh, I was the business manager. And they were doing an exhibition in 1994 on 100 Years of Horror Movies. And the exhibition curator, Barbara Stratner, got a bunch of us to help her out on it who were into film. And my friend, Lewis Paul, had a fanzine. And I was a big Carol Lindley fan from the Poseidon Adventure. And she did a lot of horror movies and thrillers. So we, she was in the exhibition. And he said to me, and I was writing the captions. And he said, why don't you do an article on it for, for my fanzine? And I did. And then he and his wife at the time said, this is really good. You should send it to Carol and see if she'll give you an interview. And she did. And I got published in um, Film Facts magazine. And I then became, like my friends call me a starlet stalker from the 60s. I did interviewed Carol Lindley, Shelley Fabre, Diane McBain, Pamela Tiffin. It was, and all the, like a lot of the actresses that worked with Elvis Presley and in the Beach Party movies. And the books became, you know, pretty popular. And, and, and I became associated with that. I love that. Starlet yeah. stalker. Love that. <laughs> and then well, I did a book, I... Hollywood Surf and Beach Movies. And that got me on Turner Classic Movies for a week, co-hosting with Ben Mankiewicz. So, yeah, I mean, that, that was sort of where I, what, was, what I was writing about. Incredible. Well, I want to dive in to this book, but I have a few things to read. Dan Riordan, or Dan's ire, says... 20-something years ago, Tom and I were members of the defunct and now legendary Ryan's Hope message board at SoapNet. Oh my gosh. Tom's <laughs> posts never failed to impress me. He wrote beautifully with insight, humor, and obvious passion for the material. He was also a charming and friendly guy who shared my disdain for the two witches of Riverside and delight for that endlessly entertaining and fascinating creature, Delia Reed, Ryan Ryan, Coleridge Crane, Coleridge. I've enjoyed Tom's other books and throughout the years have thought that if any person wrote a tribute to Ryan's hope, he should be the one. I wish Tom luck with this publication and thank him and all those who participated for helping to immortalize an underrated and greatly missed soap. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember him. <laughs> Good. That's I'm so glad. Nice that he remembered me. That was very nice of him. That's very, I'm very touched. He, he, he certainly did. And, and Wanda Weidman says, I was not an original Ryan's Hope viewer, but started watching it on SoapNet like so many others. She asked that I welcome and tell you how very glad we are that someone finally is telling the stories, characters, and actors we grew to love so dear. I started watching soaps in the late 60s before Ryan's Hope was on the air. When it did in 75, I was already firmly set in my viewing other shows. By not allowing Ryan's Hope in, 
I see that I missed a lot. They are worthy of every award they won and then some. Their fans are blessed to have Tom giving us a piece of this rich history. She emailed me yesterday to say, got my Ryan's Hope book today and already feel like I was handed a sack of gold. <laughs> That's very sweet. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. um, how did you come to write this book at this particular time? Well, um, through my partner, Ernie, I met his friend Pete, who was an agent. And Pete knew I was a big Ryan Soap fan, and he was friends with Eileen Kristen, Delia. And we ran into her on the street, and I was like a ball of jelly, because, oh, my God, it's, I, I'm, it's Delia, it's Delia. And he, introduced, he warned Eileen that, like, I was a big fan. And Eileen was just so sweet and everything. And I met her a couple times after that. And she came actually to one or two of my book parties for those books about 60s actresses. And she kept saying, you should do a book on Ryan Soap. You, you know, you interview people and everything. And I figured Claire Labine was alive. And I thought Claire would write her own book about, you know, her experiences. And she didn't. And she didn't. And then in 20, I think it was 2016, I, I decided, you know what, maybe I need to branch out of the 60s. And I approached mm -hmm. Eileen. And she was all in. And then I interviewed Roscoe Bourne. And then actually, I believe I wrote to Claire Labine, not knowing that I think she was very ill. And then she died. And then I said, well, let me do it. But I'm only going to do it if I could get um, Claire or and Paul's daughter's approval. And I got me contact with Daisy Mayer, who was the youngest daughter. And she said, oh, you need to talk to my sisters, Rachel and Ruth. And they were great. They not only gave their approval, they participated in the book. Um, I did get in contact with Claire Labine's daughter, Eleanor, who gave her blessing, but she declined to participate. And then I just took it from there. Wow. Talk about how do you dive in? Wh where do you begin? Um, <laughs> I began with the storylines and the people. I, I That's why I started with Eileen and Roscoe, <laughs> because they were my favorite characters. And then I started with the low hanging fruit, people who were still sort of around and I was easy to get their contact information and stuff. Um, some people I wrote to directly, others I had to go through uh, PR people or managers. Um, so yeah, so whoever, again, as I was sort of writing it, you know, I, I don't know if I wrote it, now I can't remember. I think I, I, I set out the chapters and then I kind of just wrote um, depending on who I got to interview. So if somebody jumped in, if I like I interviewed um, Garrett Queeley and Fred Bernstein. She played Jacqueline de Bujac and he was Laszlo Novotny. And they came on in late 83 and 84, my least favorite period. So I, you know, I was thinking I was going to say that to last, but since they were, I got to interview them. And actually those two characters I really liked. I didn't just, I didn't, because they had nothing to do with the, the Greenberg's Deli, which I despised. Um, so I started, you know, I would Horace write Scott Holmes. I, well, he's nice. I, I actually <laughs> like, I like Dave Greenberg, but it was the people they put him the, who worked there was like, forget it. Anyway, um, I have to be nice. If you... <laughs> I have to turn down, uh, tune down my comments. I've gotten in trouble already. Um, so anyway, have yeah, you, so that's, I did it. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, why was 83, 84 your least favorite? Well, because they blew, they, the ABC Maybe. fired Claire and Paul uh, after a second, or I think it was their third go around. And ABC decided they wanted to get the younger viewers. I, but what was ironic was the show was getting younger viewers. Um, it, it was always in the middle of the ratings pack, you know, of the four, 13, 14 soaps on the air. Um, at certain points in 1981, it did get up to the, they made the top five during the whole um, Kimberly, uh, Michael Pavel, Ray Wooded um, triangle and stuff. But for the most part, they were in the middle. But in the 18 to 49, women 18 to 49 demo, which was coveted by the advertisers in the 80s, they were always in the top four, top five. They, they mm -hmm. top formed all the CBS shows and all. Some all the CBS shows sometimes tied with Young and the Restless and all the NBC shows. So that young demo kept them going strong. So the fact that ABC wanted quote more young viewers, I makes no sense. So they it, it is fascinating 
the lack of, and I don't know the right word, lack of understanding, I would think that some executives have in right. the process of blowing up something as valuable as the Ryan bar to fans. It needed it sent a huge message saying this is not the Ryan's hope of you know of your this is going right. to be a new show. Uh, so they blew it up and all of a sudden these gaggle of teenage twits, as I call them, started like populating the, the deli. And you know, then it was so sad to see Maeve and Johnny come in for a pastrami sandwich or something, and you're like <laughs> you're used to seeing them behind Ryan's bar and working there. And you know, had, giving out corned beef sandwiches. <laughs> so it was very jarring. Um, and the other thing too is um, uh, Callie Timmons played Jill Coge's trashy gold digging sister when she first arrived and she's fabulous. But then this new writer decided to make her the, the selfless heroine and nobody bought it for a second. And they, they paired her with Scott Holmes as Dave Greenberg. And she's just you know, a trashy gold digger. And when this, when this writer, the writer got fired, this, this next set of writers, Malay Taggart and Tom King said, we're turning her back into a trashy gold digger. And they did. And that's what, you know, she's great, Callie, playing the trashy gold digger. And it was believable. It, it is, you know, fascinating the, the, the mistakes made on every yeah. show um, for the ultimate goal of ratings. Right. Um, you, you know, what I did find so fascinating is, you know, you weave the book through stories and storylines. Um, we talked a little backstage of how you navigated that. Can you share that with the audience? So when they're reading it, they understand, you know, you picked some because they were your favorites and some because of, you know, the interviews and. Yeah. That's why in the, in the preface, I do say, it's not definitive because I can't, it, I was actually limited to 300 pages. I got them to agree to 400 pages. So, um, because I just handed in the manuscript and they liked it. So they didn't want to cut, you know, so much, any of it. Um, so yes. So, and I say in the preface, all the interviewees, their storylines get preference. So there are some people who they're in there, but you know, some storylines don't get as much attention because there's nobody, there was nobody around for me to talk to. And again, I was limited, you know, in a, it's, it's a 13 year show. So to take 13 years of plots and, you know, and cram it into one book, it's impossible, especially if you have the interviews. So I kind of say the interviews really are the main focus of the book. I just add to keep people knowing what's going on, some of the plots and, what I find interesting on this up is the backstage stuff, the behind the scenes, you know, Claire and Paul, for any, Claire and Paul first declining ABC's offer to go to an hour, you know, which was turned out to be a big mistake. Um, ABC buying the show from Claire and Paul and then General Hospital taking off with Luke and Laura and the Ice Princess and then ABC deciding they want their entire schedule, uh, all their soaps to follow suit and trying to get Ryan's hope to toe the line and, and I say in the book, when Claire and Paul worked in tandem with ABC, like the whole Joe Novak mobster storyline, um, even the, the introduction of the Kirkland fam, there were super rich Kirklands, you know, following like the Corner Mains on General Hospital or the Buchanan family on uh, One Life to Live, it kind of worked. When they were at odds with ABC and they butted heads or it was push pull where they, they wouldn't give in or ABC wouldn't give in, that's where the soap kind of goes a little screwy. Yeah, well, you you weave it beautifully through the through the interviews, and I love that the the interviews don't just speak to Ryan's hope; they speak to other parts of the actor's journey as well. You know, Christopher Durham, for instance, talking about you know leaving Capital and Playgirl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, there's different things in the book that are really interesting about the period of time where they were, you know, working on the show or about to work on the show. I did that. Well, 
I first did that to, to broaden the, the audience because I figured, mm -hmm. you know, Ryan wasn't a Young and the Restless or a General Hospital. I, I, and I thought it was just a cult little soap. So I thought that would be interesting to the non-Ryan soap fans. Um, but then it got interesting because then they started comparing these other shows, working on other shows, to working on Ryan's Hope. Yeah. And for the most part, nothing, I mean, Ryan's Hope sounded like it was like heaven to work on. I mean, everybody seemed to love it. Um, there were people, I mean, Helen Gallagher thought we said um, the show was the most welcoming show of all the soaps, but there are obviously people in that book that do not agree with that, that they had problems that, you know, fitting in, especially- and I think that's moment, Every everywhere right. for sure. There, there's no doubt uh, at all. Um, Vicky says, loved this soap. Working at Georgia Tech between 76 and 78, and a group of us walked several times each week to watch the show at the Varsity, where they had uh, TV rooms for lunchtime viewing. Um, Greg was going to ask, and I, this is one of my questions, so many actors who appeared on the show, um, who are some of the ones you, you know, feel you, you know, really wanted and that, you know, just couldn't get? I, of course, Kate Mulgrew, she declined twice, politely. Um, Mark Helgenberger, who's Siobhan number three, declined politely. I mean, uh, uh, she wouldn't do it. Um, I, I, who else? Um Daniel U. Kelly, who played Frank Ryan, the second one, he declined, but he offered to write something for the book because he, he really loved working on the show. And so we I included that. Um, personally, I one of my favorite characters was Lee Kirkland, and I tried to get Felicity La Fortune and couldn't get her. I, don't, I never heard back. A number of them I never heard back from, either through direct contact or through managers or PR people. It could be any number. You might, you know, it may not have even reached the right. right exactly. Person. So I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't know. Um, I, for instance, Karen Morris Gowdy, um, I tried twice. I had an address and nothing. And at the last second, I don't like to call people out of the blue. So I did get a phone number and I sent a text and within minutes she responded. And then when I got to interview her, she said, if I would have saw this book, at the Barnes and Noble, you know, and not have been in, in, invited to, not have been able nah. to participate. I would have been so upset. So she goes, I am so glad you broke your rule and you contacted me. Oh, I me. love that because I like, <laughs> thank you for introducing me to Karen. I, I think she's a delight. Yeah, well, she's um, a great interview in, in, throughout the yeah, book. Yeah, she's great. There so many great interviews, so many great interviews. But you just mentioned Siobhan number whatever, right? Great. You just mentioned Hard. that. Siobhan number. Um, I don't know if it's because I read your book cover to cover, but it felt like Brian's Hope had the most recasts of any show ever. And I, is, is that something that I am just seeing because it's written in the pages? Or do you believe knowing about it? You know, I know every show you know, on Guiding Light in World Terms, I've had multiple actors play, you know, the same part, right. but it felt watching this or reading this that it was just Yes, it went. and that was one of the things I think that hurt it, the continuity. I mean, they had five Franks, four Deliers, five Siobhan's, four Patrick's. Some of people came, left and came back and they recreated the role. Um, so well, and that's interesting too because um, shows will have multiple actors, but they also age, so they're multiple. But it sounds like these were basically same age range, just being replaced. You know, four or five actors being replaced. Yeah, you know it. Yes, people left. You know, they, they let people like the late Kate. I believe they let Kate McGrew leave early because she became so a hot property. Um, a lot of them signed three-year contracts. There's an interesting story after Claire and Paul sold the show when they were recasting Joe Novak with Roscoe Bourne. Uh, Roscoe says in the book that Paul took him out to dinner and he told him, don't sign a three year contract. Don't you don't want to get, you know, and it's like, God, that's a, that's, you know, your bread and butter. You want him to sign a three year contract. But like his daughter said, he 
wasn't the producer anymore. He was just the head writer. And he felt that, you know, he must have felt something about Roscoe that it, to keep himself restricted to a soap for three years was going to be too much. So I think Roscoe signed a two year contract. Well, Paul Mayer uh, is somebody I admire immensely from oh, yes. your book and from, you know, meeting Brian McGovern through you. You know, how he helped Brian is uh, just an incredible, uh, incredible way. Stephen Bergman, if you know who, do you know Stephen? The name sounds familiar. Stephen takes photographs in the industry all the time. He says he could have gotten you in touch with Felicity. So, oh, oh, Dan. <laughs> um, and Dan's Iyer is watching right now. Oh, hi, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the other great things in the book is um, Louis Schaefer's quote, which you used twice in the book. Do you remember which one? She had a lot of great quotes. I don't. She did. Well, and I won't share it here, you know, I let people read it, but I, I loved, you know, it was just her take on a lot of decisions being made in ABC and you, you know, you use it near the, the end of the book as well. Um, she felt like an outsider because Ray Wooded was introduced in 1978 and she always thought she was getting fired, you know, and then they would, you know, they gave her a, a, a 18 year old or 17 year old daughter that nobody knew she had. And a boyfriend. And uh, right, and and and, uh, and then the the boyfriend who turned out to be the the, fa the father of her. Yeah, but she but she was very good because she you know she knew what storylines were going on, but she also knew that ABC could give a damn. They just were worried about the money they were going to make off the show, and yeah. it, it didn't matter if the story, like for instance, the Charlotte Greer story about the Irish, you know, uh, feud. And she thought it, it just wasn't right. It was a good story, and they won an Emmy for it. But for 1983. What was going on in soaps and on primetime, it was just not what the audience really wanted to see. They wanted more, you know, if they were able to balance it with some glitz and glamour, um, that you know, they it might have worked more. The show might have gotten higher ratings when, when when they brought them back, but they really concentrated on that story way too much. And um, unfortunately it didn't work. And at the end of it, they got an Emmy and they got fired and a pink slip. <laughs> um Talk about some of the research, you know, you spoke to Paul's daughters. Um, you mentioned the soap reporter who passed away in 1986, where you got a lot of the synopsis from. John Michael Reed, yes. Um, he did a, a a weekly soap column where he would do um, recaps of the soaps from the week before, and that was invaluable. Um, one of the fans way back did uh, so uh, a website called Ryan's Bar Online. And actually, I actually met, I don't remember his name. I actually met him when we went to see Eileen do a, a, a play or a reading. And he did, um, he had some like real detailed synopsis on his website, but stopped, I think around 1980 or 81. And, um, but the web, I don't know what happened to him, but the website is still up there. And, and then also there's so many, there's, Ryan, there's so many Facebook fan pages, Remembering Ryan's Hope, Ryan's Hope, Ryan's Hope, the soap opera, and all these fans put stuff up there and they put, sometimes they digitize and they put magazine articles and stuff. So all mm -hmm. that stuff and all those people were great. And kudos to whoever put the Ryan's Hope online uh, on YouTube, because that was, you know, all the Ryan's Hope episodes you could watch. I was constantly watching uh, Ryan's Hope. That's, like, you know, that's what I mean. The the young woman I met last night, you know, yeah. never watched it when it was on television. And I find that fascinating to, to, to find something like that and to watch it throughout. Um, so many fans are curious. Do you know the official reason why Soapnet never went past 1981. Is there an official ever? No, there were so many rumors. First, it was like first Soapnet said, "Oh, we our our reach has doubled, so we want people to see enjoy Ryan Soap from the beginning." So the re that was the first time they rewound it. That was the, why they said they rewound it. And then th you got to the end of 1981, and right after the Egyptian ball, and again they rewound it. And then people were like getting, "Hmm, what's going on here?" And then supposedly there was the music rights they, or I think there might've been a, like a con new contract for 1982 and 
made it expensive for them because of the it may have been the music. I don't know. Um, some people think they didn't have the tapes, but they the whole thing exists because um, they used at the very beginning they used to show the soapnet used to show two episodes a day, and on the weekend they would do a marathon of all those episodes. And sometimes at you know, St. Patrick's Day, they showed all the same, all the St. Patrick's Day episodes from 1975 through 1988. So obviously they had 88, 87, 86, 85. And as a little minor thing, well, when the Twin Towers got, unfortunately, in 2001 hit, I was oblivious sitting home in my apartment in Chelsea watching Ryan's Hope and I had no idea what was going on around me until my mother called and said, are you all right? Are you all right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, she goes I'm watching Ryan's Hope. Turn the channel. Turn the channel. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. They, they, they didn't break in for news on SoapNet. SoapNet. No, they didn't. So I was no. like eating my cereal ready to get watch Ryan's Hope. <laughs> that is hysterical. Uh, I love that. What were some of your favorite storylines? Um, the beginning with, you know, Delia pushing her two-timing husband down the flight of stairs. I mean, everyone, everything was Delia's fault. That was a joke during those those message boards that Dan was talking about. Like, everybody blamed Delia for everything. And it became, somebody actually used the, it's all Delia's fault. And yeah, she did push him down the stairs, but he shouldn't have asked for a divorce standing on the top of a stairwell to marry his, you know, mistress of the years. So us Delia fans had every you know excuse to protect Delia. So that was a favorite one. Um, when Delia tricked Patrick to marry her when she got pregnant and then had a miscarriage, but didn't tell him she had a miscarriage and then wound up marrying him anyway. And then she faked blindness amongst, that was a funny storyline. I love anything in the 80s with Joe Novak and the mob and the Crystal Palace. Um, restaurant that Delia owned that whole, that, for, like I said, from 79 to 83. I love the Kirkland family. I know people out there hate the Kirklands. I thought they were great. And I, I love Kimberly and Seneca and uh, Michael and Ray, that quadrangle in um, 80, 81. Um, later storylines, I love, they, uh, Millet and Tom took the four down and dirty schemers, Delia, Roger, Dakota, and, and Maggie. And threw them in a storyline where Delia is gaslighting Maggie and she's uh, hawking. It, it, it was really good. It was the round delay of those four characters was fun. Um, oh, and I liked when um, they brought in uh, the age, the was Soraz, the soap opera rapid yeah, raging system. Uh, <laughs> yeah. They made little John, he went from like 10 to like 19, and he shows yeah. up unmarried with a kid. And um, that storyline I thought was good. So yeah, there was a lot of them I liked. And um, there was a few that I didn't like, but I kept watching. That's awesome. Um, before I bring out our guests, what? how does it feel having Eileen write the foreword for the book for you? Oh, she was the only choice. Um, people were telling me you should get this one, you should get that one. I said, no, I, Eileen is the one that, she's the one that is the whole impetus for this whole thing. So no, I, I'm going to ask Eileen if she says no, then I'll take it from there. But she said yes right away. And so it was, uh, it, it was great. Well, that's awesome. Well, Dakota Smith, Christopher Durham is joining us now. Eileen Kristen should be here momentarily. Hello, Mr. Durham. Hello. I listened to this whole thing and I'm, I, I have tears in my eyes. I wasn't <laughs> there in the early days, but thank you, Tom. And Alan, we've spoken before. Um, um, it's a pleasure to see you both, and thank you for including me. Well, I'm so glad. Well, you, you um, yes, well, there you go. Me too. Oral history of Bay Times groundbreaking soap. It's, <laughs> I didn't put it down, honestly, and I was only there for three years, so brilliant. So, um, well, that, that, that's what I loved. You called me immediately after reading it. You were like, wow. I, I was I was blown away, and I just want to. Well, I, do you got to introduce Eileen because I don't want to take Eileen's not here yet. I'm going to check to see where she is. Keep talking. Okay, she's probably rehearsing for a play. That's my. Yeah. Question. That's something. She never she never stops. I do, but um, I wanted to say uh, to Tom when we spoke on the phone when he sent me a galley, you know, an early copy of the book. I wasn't there for a lot of it, but I'm I'm a brain picker. I. I talked to everybody, Helen, Bernie, Nancy, when she was alive. 
Tom got everything right. And it's the weirdest thing. I mean, I question my memory now at 64 years old. Everything he told me I had asked about was like, that's exactly what they said. And sometimes that doesn't happen. And I applaud you, Tom, for that. And I told you that on the phone. It's real. It's true. Ryan's Hope is an amazing family for me. Uh, it, Tom did it totally right without any National Enquirer episodes to try. You know, there's enough stuff going on backstage in the forefront with the writers and the directors and the actors. And he got it right. And I, I just so appreciate the realness of your book, Tom. Oh, thank you. Great thank job. you for participating in it. Great job. Well, it, it, and that's, you know, just doing the show and seeing people's excitement again, you know, the show has been off the air for 34 years. And to see that excitement just still shows the power of this medium. You know, I think you heard me say I met a, you know, a college student who never saw this a day in her life on television and is watching yeah. it on YouTube. I almost find that it's funny when you said this and I've heard it before. It's a, listen, I was a, you know, a kid at 12, I would watch the BBC. It was our fourth network as a kid in a little town of Virginia. I would watch the six wives of Henry VIII and, you know, uh, with Keith Michelle and Glenda Jackson, Elizabeth R, which were sagas. But, um, I didn't know about soap operas only because I was in school. And so when people um, talk about that and, it, it, you know, there was something incredibly special about Ryan's Hope in my years there. It was so tight knit and so well constructed. Um, I've never forgotten that. And I just really, really appreciate it. Just amazing. Very, very different because I did three other soap operas. Um, you know, one before and two after. There was nothing like Ryan's Hope, and that's okay. Everything's different, but Ryan's Hope it always has a very special place in my heart. I love that. Well, now I will introduce the Delia Ryan, 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 Coleridge, whatever. <laughs> you know, she's got about 12 of them. I think Kristen, everybody. <laughs> well, I, I was being... Oh, oh, oh my God! God. <laughs> I was being polite and waiting until I was asked to come in. <laughs> she was. I was supposed to enter myself. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Well, we've been talking about Delia. We've been talking about um, you writing the foreword and just, you know, talking about people's love of this show. Um, I love that it was your idea and suggested this to Tom. Um, does it surprise you to see the excitement about this book 34 years after the show went off the air? You know, actually, it doesn't surprise me because uh, being out and about in New York so often and being stopped on the street and uh, people telling me how much they love Ryan's Hope, and that was a long time ago. And I've done a you know bunch of shows in between that, but that's the show that they really you know, their hearts are still with that show. It's amazing. It's really extraordinary. So it doesn't really totally surprise me. Yeah, I I love it. I love, you know, people's excitement about getting this book and picking it up and, and you know, and I did not watch Ryan's Hope. So I read it. I read it cover to cover and was really just, the, the story's, you know, everybody's stories. There's so many great stories in it. Um, so many great stories. Well, both of you, you know, Eileen, you were there from day one. Talk about what you remember about your audition or screen test or whatever you had to do again uh, to get this role of one of the greatest daytime characters. Well, I remember when my agent had talked to me about it and I said I really wasn't um, interested in doing a soap particularly because I was kind of on a comedy track. And uh, he said, well, it, it, it probably won't last longer than six months. <laughs> but uh, and then uh, I read the uh, background material, I think what they call the Bible. They actually let the actors read some of the Bible and the description of Delia. And as soon as I read this description of the character, I really became extremely intrigued. It, it took on a whole 
new meaning what doing a character like this might mean. And um, I was interested. And what was amazing about it was that Shirley Rich was the original casting person. And I had a pretty close relationship with Shirley and I trusted her very much. And the wonderful thing about Shirley was she didn't bring in 50 people for the part. You know, she just brought in certain people and um, she had it narrowed down even before it started. So I like that. And also she was not scared to talk about you to Claire and Paul. So when I walked into my first audition to see them, I remember Claire being <laughs> like this, and she knew a lot about me. She had known I had done Greece and they were so warm and they were so friendly and, and it went very well. And then when I went back for the final audition uh, for being put on video, uh, tape, which was kind of scary. But the interesting thing was, I didn't know you're not supposed to wear white. And I had this white shirt on, which flares. And as I was doing the scene, it's probably flaring and a button popped off and I just kept on going. <laughs> and they loved that. They loved my audition and uh, I got it. But they didn't put you through hoops. You know, I didn't feel like I was just being asked to just do things needlessly. It was very, and, the whole audition process. And she was based on Paul's wife. Is that what, correct? Well, That's that was a secret the whole time. <laughs> so they tell me, yes. <laughs> That's I love that. I love that. And I love I love Sasha. I love Eileen and I talk by phone. You look the same when I first met you in 1986. <laughs> really do. Good for you, uh, girl. Uh, <laughs> Good I, do a lot of yoga. I do a lot of yoga and I take a lot of supplements. I know. <laughs> Eileen and I could tell you about supplements and holistic and yeah. Yeah, yeah you look pretty great yourself, Chris. Well, you know, thanks. It's all lighting and mirrors. I mean, and Floyd Tom, says, Tom never ages. No, oh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> no, I swear. Now I've known you now a long time. It's kind of scary. <laughs> it's kind of scary. <laughs> Uh, Eileen Floyd says, Eileen, in 50 years of soap viewing, one of my all time favorites was Delia's Chinese cooking lessons. You could literally <laughs> see the wheels turning in Dee's mind. Fabulous. You rock. <laughs> Thank you. And it was an amazing storyline. It was funny. It was intriguing. Uh, Ron and I, Ron Hale and I had so much fun doing it. You know, sometimes you, you say to yourself, they're actually paying me to do something that I would pay them to do. And that Chinese cooking stuff uh, was really, it was really great fun, you know, and, and it was Celia at her most lying, you know, best. <laughs> scheming, scheming, scheming. Chris, scheming. take us back to your audition and screen test for Dakota. Um, <clears throat> sure. Uh, I was in LA for uh, three years. I did Capital, a CBS soap opera for two years. And then I got off and I was, you know, like any actor, I was doing guest spots and stuff and, you know, scrambling. But I really miss New York because I started in New York City um, in 82. But I knew I needed a job, to, you know, I wasn't rich. I didn't. And um, they put me on tape, like Eileen just said, in Los Angeles for this role of Dakota Smith. And, you know, people don't realize this. I had tested for days of our lives, General Hospital, and I didn't get them. So be it. That's the way it goes. But this was in New York. And, and you know, I had my fingers crossed. And I remember I was leaving to do summer stock. So I flew to New York City and tested with Nancy Addison um, for the part of Dakota. And I flew right away to Milwaukee to do summer stock. When I arrived, I got a phone call from my agent and said, you also, you booked the part of Dakota. And I think I was the happiest man in the world, A, because I get to come back to New York with a job. And um, 
I didn't know about Ryan Soap. I've never watched soap operas, but most working actors don't because, you know, you're working or you're trying to work or whatever. And um, it was just such a gift to me. And then coming back and doing it for three years from 85 through 88, I, I didn't know it then, but now I hope I'm a little wiser. I'm certainly older. It was the best, the best years of my life with a group of core actors who were always like Eileen, always theater actors. And we supported each other. We went to each other's shows. It was a, you know, a job, a, a, an important job. And um, uh, it, it was it was one of the best times of my life feeling like I, I was a part of a, a really supportive family of actors. And I, you know, I'll never forget that. And here we are today. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> Absolutely. Eileen, you, you talk about the last four years being the best time on the show. What what made it so? Oh, several reasons. You know, um, I had I had gone away from the show once in the late 70s, and then uh I was let go uh in 82, and then I was asked to come back. And when I was asked to come back, <laughs> I had a very pretty deep conversation with Joe Hardy and I somehow knew that it was going to be good. And I had a flourishing off Broadway career. So I, I explained to him that I wanted to make sure that I could continue doing that. And uh, he was good with that. And it just, I, I think Claire and Paul had come back. I believe they had come back. Um, uh, no, uh, no. When you came back, Malay and Tom King was still writing it, and then Claire came back a couple of months in early '87. She came back, so you came right. on like in September of '86. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I love Malay and Tom, and they wrote great comedy, and um, they they just had they were very good. So uh, I, I I pretty much knew I was in good hands, and uh, Chris and I had some fun things, didn't we? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yes, sorry. I'm sorry about the dogs. I'm in my home. I have so many animals. Can I tell a story? This is why I've always loved Eileen, but I mean, how can you not? Eileen, tell me if you remember this, because I don't remember some things. We had a scene where, and I think Millet and Tom wrote this, Maggie, Callie Timmons, we were trying to set her up with some jewels or something, so yeah, we she was living above the bar. Don't ask me why. And Delia and Dakota went up to plant. Eileen, please correct me if I'm totally wrong. But the funny thing was, we were planting something in her room, all right? And this is why I loved working with Eileen, because we're both good at thinking and on our feet. We went in. It was a dresser. We're filming. We slammed the door, and the mirror fell down on the dresser, which wasn't supposed to. Just grab the mirror. She's put it back up. Lean it. I said, yes, that's fine. Hold on. Maggie knocked on the door. I love that she ran off because my dog. <laughs> the, she had a doorbell or something. The way the scene went, Callie Timmons, as Maggie knocked on the door, we opened. She goes, why are you here? And we said, we thought we heard a burglar. So we came up to check. But the thing was, we, Eileen and I, because, you know, when you're doing a soap, no matter what, you don't really stop unless they yell cut, unless, you know, you hit your head on something or you bleed, whatever. But Eileen is always so fabulous with that thing. We simply pushed the mirror in the back. Eileen did. We kept going. Callie Timmons, Maggie knocked on the door. She goes, why are you here? Because we heard something upstairs. We thought it was a burglar. <laughs> <laughs> and they kept it. And I'll never forget, you and I, now we would high five. We hugged each other. And I remember Tamara Grady, our wonderful stage manager, said, good job, guys. Because otherwise you have to go back and start over. And it takes a little bit of time. You always knew with Eileen, who never goes up on anything. If you not, did, not you, true. Well, <laughs> some people do. But, you know, look, I loved everybody up there. But I always knew with Eileen, if one of us went up, you don't have to wink at Eileen. She's going to get it because she's done so much theater. And, you know, you want to keep going. And she was always the go-to girl. And there were a few others on the show, too. You just knew it's going to be fine. We're going to do one take, and it'll be great. And I love you for that. Thank oh, you. Well, it was great working with you. It really, 
We had we had fun. We got to do some comedy. I'm not a she. She was always a comedic thing, like you know, uh, yeah. So she she really got to do comedy on the show. And you were the only one. There's uh, only one on any soap I find that gets to do comedy because they're not made for comedy. But I mean, as Delia was on the girl. I mean, I, there were some comic things going on on Ryan's Hope quite a bit, but I think I, I guess I did most of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where where did your love of comedy start, Eileen? Oh, uh, Lucy, <laughs> Lucy, Lucy, and Lucy, and the Dick Van Dyke Show. Wow. The Dick Van Dyke Show was so special to me as a kid. And, um, you know, we had, uh, a, for some reason in my family, we never had a TV in the uh, living room because it was too ugly or something. So we ha I had one in my bedroom. Back then they were. <laughs> They were big and ugly. But we had one in my parents' room up in a closet. So I, we all used to sit, the four of us used to sit eating pistachio nuts that at that time were dyed red. Yes. <laughs> like, why were they dyed red? But that's what we used to do. We used to sit, and no wonder I have neck issues, because <laughs> the, the, the television was up in their closet and we used to sit like this. And we used to watch Candid Camera and Dick Van Dyke and I Love Lucy and <laughs> eat red pistachio nuts and your hands would be all red. So I think that definitely uh, in those formative years of life, um, I, I felt that it was, it somehow was a very important thing to make, to have the ability to make people laugh. Wow. You know? If you can wow. make people laugh, I think it's a gift. Um, yeah. I don't know if you have HBO Max, but uh, the Mary Tyler yeah. Moore documentary. I've seen it many times. Okay, yeah, I'm halfway through, but I'm past the Dick Van Dyke stuff, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, you know, so her story. Yeah, so interesting. Um, Chris, how, you know, you were hired to play this character, and, you know, you talk about it in the book. Um, you know, how did it feel to find out you know, Claire didn't love the character of Dakota. Honestly, if my memory's true, it bummed me out. And I learned it because like Eileen and Kate Mulgrew, I didn't know Claire because Tom and Millie, Tom King and Millie Taggart wrote my character. And then I think whatever, a year and a half, a Claire came back. Um, I found out from Nancy Addison because she was very good friends with Claire. Um, that she goes, I could, I would never create his character, you know, because she's very Catholic and I got it. But if my memory serves me, we had a phone conversation. I knew he was really popular on the show. And I like to think I don't have much of an ego, but she goes, the only way I'm going to keep you on is to turn you into a bad guy. And she said, I would have never written your character into the show. I get it. I get it. Um, but that has more to do with being a bad guy, which was a lot of fun, you know, but um, I said in the book, which Tom, at the end of the show, they weren't going to ask me back to pop up at the bar when Helen Gallagher's singing that. <laughs> I'm like, Cause Claire was like, ah, ah. <laughs> because they, they had fired me three months before the end of the show. Um, I didn't, I mean, I didn't know the show was going to end, but uh, you know, and I was like, okay, well you get another job. But, uh, and then the show got canceled. But yeah, Claire, look, I love Claire. Everybody loved her. And I met her and she was lovely. And I loved her honesty. She says, I would have never created your character if I had been in the rain. I get it. I had a good time. You know, I, oh, sorry. I, I just did a, uh, on social media, Facebook, one of my, um, listing some of my favorite storylines and the Dakota one was one of them. And I got a barrage of people to this day that, hated dakota the no johnny would never have had an affair you know even a one night stand on you know and i was like well the show needed some shaking up and what better way to shake the show up is to bring an illegitimate ryan <laughs> into the into the fold yeah. but a lot of fans yeah. did not like that. Day, i mean i i don't know I, people That's didn't like you know it, i think they like you but they family. didn't like the way yeah. yeah i guess given did, the basis you know, of you, new york city catholic irish upbringing who knows what people do? Um, if I was Claire, I probably wouldn't have written them either. But I think it did shake things up a little bit. And I know yeah. with Delia, and we had a lot of fun. I mean, they, she turned me into a bad guy. And I'm like, 
how great you start off as a romantic hero. You know, Dakota Smith was based on Indiana Jones. Mildly, <laughs> but, <laughs> back, you know, they came up with a name. Yeah, I had a boat, but to get to be on a show for three years, which is a good run and to go from being a hero, which is always boring to a bad guy. I, I was fine with it. I thought it was great. Did you know when you were hired that you would be Johnny's uh, illegitimate son? Do you think? No, they never told me. Yeah. No. Didn't know. Yeah, they don't tell you things like that usually. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. We do that. Uh, Roy Bowen says for for you, Chris, playing the love child of Johnny, um, those scenes were volatile, emotional, and amazing with Bernie, Helen, and Nancy. What do you remember about you know that blow up with Helen? I got to be honest with you. I come from a very religious Southern Baptist family. We never had confrontation. Nobody drank. No one blew up. As an actor, and I was so young then, I'm not good with, I'm better now. I didn't like those scenes because I don't think I really knew how to play them because I didn't ever witness it in my life. So I was uneasy with it because I never had any experience. I had experience with love, you know, romance, you know, as a young man. I think I kind of blocked them out, but I always knew whatever they wrote with Bernie and and um, Helen, who I adored. I got it. And Eileen, she probably did the same thing. I used to pick their brains when they wanted to go call their spouses and stuff. Like, tell me about when you were on Craft Music Hall and all this. I, I love old movies and stuff. And I was always picking their brains about their careers. And Michael Levin, you know, and Ron Hale. Uh, Eileen, you're way too young, so I didn't go to you. But, but <laughs> I, I honestly don't remember the last stuff very well because I think, yes, I'm an actor and you got to do it. I wasn't real comfortable with it. And I, I think that was fine. I mean, that, I hope I did okay, but I'm not sure. I didn't like those confrontational scenes because I'd never had that experience in my life. Well, you, there's a great scene, and it's on YouTube, where uh, Maeve throw, tries to throw you out of the house, and Johnny says, lady, if he goes, I go. And then there's a big fight, and then she won't back down, and Johnny storms out. And then you um, rule, you know, you sort of like rub it in Maeve's face as like, oh, you're not rule, you're not ruling this nest anymore. And and you were great, and she was great, and Eileen's in the scene too. But Delia's sitting there, standing there with a like mouth agape, like, oh my God, what's going on? Yeah. And it's on YouTube, and it was fabulous. Well, I'd like to see those scenes. I I would like to see. Ooh, them. I yeah, me too. Did I was not comfortable with. I'm never comfortable with confrontation, even in my life. But even as yeah, it was it was weird. Yeah, confrontation isn't easy uh, at all. Uh, did know. either of you watch it when it was on SoapNet? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, was yes. It, what was it like to revisit it? Scary in a way. <laughs> Some of the scenes I remembered really, really well. Um, I didn't, you know, I was working on One Life to Live at the time. So, uh, I didn't get to see, well, I, I got to see qu quite a bit. And a lot, of, a lot of that stuff is that early stuff. The first three years is on YouTube. Um, but it was really like, first of all, my voice was so much, I can't even do it how high my voice was. <laughs> I'm not a smoker and I'm not a drinker. So I don't even know how I got this. Friend. She's fabulous. <laughs> but, but, but my voice was so childlike. Um, so it, it was interesting. And also, you know, oddly enough, I came, I came from a very balanced family. I don't know if we had any fights. Uh, I, every once in a while, my father would get upset with me cause I used to leave like every light on and, you know, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And, uh, didn't so, every parent yell at us for t leaving the lights so on? That was about my only experience with conflict. You know, I, as I said, I had kind of a, a, a musical comedy, um, you know, we were Latin dancers. My whole, my, my sister, not my sister so much, but my parents and I, 
we loved to Latin dance. So I was always going off to clubs with them somehow and Latin dancing. So I didn't have a lot of confrontations. So having to play this character and having all these acrimonious scenes was pretty scary because it was something that was very foreign to me. I never had really a fight with anybody. And um, so looking back and seeing, and the brilliance of Ryan's Hope, uh, particularly in that first three years was the camera work. They had three expert cameramen. I guess they had worked with Leela on um, Dark Shadows. And the camera work was sensational. It caught, uh, you know, I had a scene in the kitchen with Karen Morris Gowdy and um, Pat and with, and the camera work was you know what scene I'm talking about, Tom, where they're they're just confronting me on everything. And when one person oh, right. yes. end up confronting me, then someone else comes into the kitchen. <laughs> the camera work. The camera work was amazing. That show um, really told a story. Being confronted when you're a troublemaker seems like you know par for the course. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Come up and I was just going to say the scariest day I ever had, though. Well, one of the scariest days was I had a 12 page monologue in a confessional with Father McShane. And that and I had to stop at one point. I think I got to page 10 and I just I like, where where am I? <laughs> I have no idea where I am, I you know. It, it, was, it was just these monologues and, and Father McShane going, yes, my child. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Is and that on YouTube? I want to find that now. <laughs> I, I guess Tom would probably know what year that was. I haven't stumbled across that one. It must be. I think they have everything from. Oh, until... you need to find that one. Yeah, that's funny. That is funny. Plus everything. It's a lot. Yeah. Eileen, you have a show coming up on November 10th. Tell us about it. Yes, uh, it's called Kip and Sylvia Tonight on D-Deck. And it's about a very, very bad songwriting couple in a worse marriage on a cruise ship that's sinking <laughs> and that people have stomach poisoning on. And it's, uh, I'd say it's a little over an hour and it's got some of the worst music you've ever heard, but intentionally so. And... Um, some politically very incorrect jokes. And then Paul Schaefer is going to be introducing us. And what? I'm doing it with the writer, uh, the writer, um, Tom Leopold. And uh, he wants a crack at it. And we're, um, we're going off book. We had done it as, I had done it as a reading with um, Loudon Wainwright, who was absolutely brilliant. So I'm now I'm doing it with the writer. And it's part of the New York Comedy Festival. So it's at the Triad, everybody. T-R-I-A-D. Where is that? That, that is, is but West 72nd Street, and it's at 7 p.m. on November 10th. By the I way, she's not telling, it's a la Triad is a landmark. They get great shows. Kudos to you, Eileen. Good for Thank you. you. Thank you so much. The link is up down below on YouTube for everybody. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, congratulations on an amazing book. Thank you. I hope everyone goes out and picks it up. Eileen, Christopher, thank you so much for being here. Stay, stay backstage for just a minute as I sign off quickly. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in today. Uh, thank you to Tom, Eileen, Chris for joining me. And don't forget, you can pick up Tom's book, Where Books Are Sold. Um, if you love daytime, you're going to love this book. I promise you. Like I said, I never watched. Join me tomorrow when The Young and the Restless is Michael Damien joins me live. If you haven't yet, subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can do so down below. Turn on notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And I hope you all have a great afternoon. Stay safe, and I'll see you tomorrow.